Buying your first home, refinancing, improving your credit score, buying an investment property, or even home design tips. We got you covered. Welcome to Mortgage Matters. I'm Krithika Swani and we've been talking about home buying, refinancing and mortgage tips with Shashank Shekhar, the CEO of Arcus Lending. So Shashank, welcome. Thank you. So Shashank, today we'll talk about refinancing. Sure. So what are the usual reasons for refinancing? Uh, there are several reasons for refinance. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, the number one reason why I see people refinancing is uh, uh, lowering down their interest rate. So, for example, someone has a 4% interest rate on a 30-year fixed. They, their loan officer calls them or they track the market and they are able to find that, oh, the current rates are now 3.75 or 3.625. If that's the case, then they will initiate a refinance process, try to reduce their interest rate. Uh, but that's not the only reason why someone should refinance or someone refinances. Uh, the other reasons could be, and again, the big reasons are uh, sometimes lowering down the payment. Sometime someone is on a short-term loan, like say a 15 or a 20 years, and they are finding it difficult to make that payment because it's a short-term loan, because of maybe something happened financially. And they want to move to a longer-term loan, say a 30-year loan where the payment will be lower than what they have right now. And I see that happening in some cases. And in some cases, it's the other way around. People who have had a 30-year loan, they have paid down their mortgage to a certain point of time, and now they're like, okay, we need to wrap up this mortgage soon. We need to pay off this mortgage soon. So there we see uh, a different trend. There are people moving from a 30-year loan to say a 15 or a 20-year loan. We see that happening. And then there is uh, people who have say an adjustable rate mortgage and they see the rates are going up now and they want to move to a fixed year, fixed uh, mortgage loan. And we see that trend. We have, there are also reasons where people have mortgage insurance and they want to eliminate mortgage insurance because their home prices went up yeah. or they have paid down their principal. So, just because you think that you cannot refinance because there are no lower interest rate than you already have. Meaning, say if you already have 3.5% 30-year fixed mortgage um, and there is no rate which is lower than that, that shouldn't be the only reason why I would refinance. There could be other reasons because of which you might still benefit from refinancing. And one of the most common being just reduce the term of the loan. So what kind of um, closing costs can someone expect? So that's one challenge. When, when we're looking at refinancing and trying to make sense that would it be beneficial for me to refinance, one important factor is the closing cost. Let's go back to the example that we were talking about, which is if someone has a 4% interest rate yeah. and they find out that they can get 3.75 or a 3.625. Now, on the face of it, it makes sense, right? You have a, you have a 4% rate, why not take a lower interest rate? Mm -hmm. But what if that loan came at four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 closing cost? Now suddenly there may not be any benefit in refinancing. Yes, you are saving $40, $50 a month, but to save that, you have to pay four, or $5,000 upfront, which means like for next 100 months, you're not going to have any benefit from this refinancing. And closing costs can be sometimes very high. Um, we at Arcus Lending typically do most refinances at no closing cost, but that's not the same for all the lenders and, and the banks out there. So when you're when you're looking at refinancing, don't just look at if you're getting an interest rate reduction, because that's just one aspect of refinancing. Also look at what is it taking you to get that lower interest rate. If you can get quarter percent lower interest rate without paying any closing costs or very little closing costs, then absolutely you should go ahead and do that. But if you're paying quarter, if you're taking quarter percent lower interest rate, but end up paying a very, very high closing cost for that then maybe that's something you should not be exploring. So whenever you are asking for a quote from a loan officer, and also one of the things that, that lenders might do is that they might tell you there's no closing cost. What that means is that, oh, you don't have to bring any cash to the table. This is a no closing cost loan. What they are doing is that they are taking, still asking you to pay the closing cost, and they're just adding, you, adding your, that money to your loan. So if you had a $300,000 loan before, now you have a $305,000 loan, and you are not bringing any cash to the table, but you increased your mortgage balance, which means it will take you even longer to pay off that mortgage balance. So be careful about that technique because that's something which, uh, something that you should not be doing. So is there a way to track mortgage rates? So when you are, uh, when you have already bought a home and you are already in the home, one of the the biggest mistakes that people do is that they take their eyes off the interest rate, yeah. uh, because they're all happy. They have bought their first home. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sure they're emotionally jubilant about it and everything. But one of the biggest tips, and I talk about that in my, in my new book as well, is that always keep an eye on where the rates are. The mortgage rate can change on a daily basis. So the, the, the benefit of keeping an eye on the mortgage rate is that, uh, say you started with a 4% rate, that's what you got. If you have kept your eye on the mortgage rate, maybe the rate falls to 3.75. Maybe you can get that kind of a new loan at no closing cost in some cases. If you can do that, then you should do it because that can save you, say, $10,000 over the life of the loan, maybe more depending on, on your loan amount. Uh, one way to track mortgage rates is, of course, make sure you work with a loan officer in the first place who tracks the rate for you. Okay. Uh, and that should be, that's something, in fact, you should be asking up front. Even when you're thinking of buying a home, uh, when you're interviewing different lenders, you should ask them, hey, do you track my mortgage rates? Uh, so you get me a great rate and good service and all that, but once I bought a home, would you be tracking it? We track mortgage rates for all our clients throughout their life. We, we call it mortgage under management, where we track every single uh, of our client through a special software. Anytime the rate drops, they get a notification that interest rate dropped. So that's one way of finding out. The other way are some public websites that they can look at. They can look at uh, mortgage rates are publicized uh, every week by Freddie Mac. So they can go to freddiemac.com and see where the, where the mortgage rates are. Uh, but really the most convenient, because I know about how clients behave. Once they have bought a home, they live in a home, they don't proactively look into freddiemac.com or they don't proactively go to a public website and look at it. Yes, sometimes they're watching the media and it's on CNN or CNBC or something. But really the best way is for your loan officer to do it because that loan officer knows your specific situation and will be able to tell you what exact rate would you be able to get. Because what you hear on the media may or may not apply to you. So on that note, we'll take a quick break. Keep watching Mortgage Matters. Welcome back. You're watching Mortgage Matters. I'm Kritika Swani in conversation with Shashank Shekhar, the CEO of Arcus Lending. So Shashank, we were talking about investment property and refinancement. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the essentials of buying an investment property, mm -hmm. why should you buy it? So I'm a big believer in, in investing into real estate. And the reason for that, uh, there are multifold reasons. Let's talk about them. Uh, one, it's, it's basic financial planning 101, uh, all financial planners will tell you is that you need to hedge your risk. You don't put all your, bas all your, all your eggs in one basket. We, you don't just take all the money and put it in, say, stocks, or you don't take all the money and put it in a 401k. You need to diversify your portfolio, and real estate plays uh, a key role in that. If you have money, then you have some money in stocks, some money in retirement funds. You can invest some money into real estate. Uh, so if the prices of one asset goes up and the other asset goes down, you're still protected across your investment portfolio. And that's one. The second is the leverage that you can get on a real estate investment is, is just not there for any other asset class. Let me give you an example. Um, say if you buy an Apple stock, you have to buy, say you want to buy $5,000 worth of Apple stock. How much money do you have to put to buy $5,000 worth of Apple stock? $5,000, right? Nobody is giving you loan to buy an Apple stock. Yeah. So you put $5,000. If the price doubles in five years, you put $5,000, you got $5,000 from it. So your investment doubled, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take an example of a real estate investment, a similar example. So say if you're buying something which is worth $200,000. But in this case, you don't have to put $200,000. You can put 20% down or 25% down and let the bank give you the rest of the money. So all you are putting on the table is, say, $50,000. Now the value of the real estate doubles. So same example as the Apple stock, right? Say in five years, that $200,000 becomes $400,000. Now when you sell the home, the extra $200,000, bank has no stake in it. Bank, you only need to pay back $150,000 loan that you got. Mm -hmm. So you put $50,000, but you were able to get $200,000 from it. So you were able to quadruple the investment that you made. That kind of leverage in terms of the money that you put into an asset class and what you get out of it is not available in anything else that you do. 
If you do 401k, it's the same thing. You have to put the entire money unless your employer is putting something. If to buy any stocks, you have to do the same thing. If you have to buy $5,000 worth of Apple stock, you have to put $5,000 from your own pocket. If you want to buy bonds or treasuries or anything else, it's your money that goes there. So if the, if the value doubles, you get to keep all the money, but you had to put 100% money in the first, first case. In a real estate, you can put 20, 25% of the value of the home and can benefit from the entire gain which comes back to you. Where can you buy it from? So investment properties are, are tricky in the sense that when we talk about primary residence, right? I usually say that don't always look at the investment angle behind a primary residence because primary residence, you're buying it for a lot of emotional reasons, right? Your kids get to play in the backyard, they get to get in the school, your wife gets to cook in the, in the big kitchen, you get to watch the big TV, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're buying investment property, then it's purely a financial decision, right? You are trying to do it so that you can make money from it because there is not much emotional benefit of owning an investment property. So cash flow and appreciation becomes two really key component of buying investment property. Uh, what cash flow means is how much money you are putting into that property every month and how much money you are getting out as a rent from that. And ideally, especially if you're a first time investor, you would want a cash flow positive property. So if, you're, if your mortgage, your property tax, your home insurance, your maintenance, your property management cost, all of that is say $1,500 a month, then the property needs to rent out for 16, 17, $1,800 a month because that way you are making some money from that property every month. And the, uh, the second thing other than the cash flow is the appreciation. So, okay, you're getting some money from it every month, but if you want to sell it, say after five years or 10 years, if I bought this property for $200,000, can I sell it for $300,000? Uh, that's the appreciation of the property. And in, while buying investment property, most people make the mistake of either doing one or the other. So they will buy a property which is cash flow positive, but has very little to no appreciation. They buy it in a market where they can buy it cheap, they can get a tenant to pay them a rent, which is more than the mortgage that they are paying, but really there is very little appreciation on that. Or they will buy in an expensive area, like say Bay Area, where even for an investment property you are paying a million dollars. And yes, it will appreciate most likely because it is an appreciating uh, market, but you're getting no cash flow from it. Every month you are paying your primary residence mortgage and you also have to pay some money towards that investment property because the rent that you're getting from it is not enough. Yeah. So what we advise our clients is, and there are some markets in the US where you can get the best, best of both worlds. For example, as in we have had a lot of dozens of our clients buy in the Dallas market, where uh, the home prices are not that expensive. You can buy it, say, somewhere in the $200,000 range, can still have cash flow positive, uh, and the properties are still appreciating in, in most parts of Texas. And not, I'm not saying that's the only market, but I'm saying do your research, figure out what markets are there in that country, which can uh, uh, hopefully offer you both cash flow and appreciation. So Shashank, what are some of the mortgage options available? So that's right, if you're thinking about buying an investment property, um, you start by first figuring out should you be buying it, and we talked about it, and then you figure out as in where do we buy it, what are the things we should be looking for, and we talked about cash flow and appreciation. And then if you're all sold into this concept, they're like, can I get loan for this? As yeah. in the, and, and, and yes, you can. And there are minor differences between the loan that you can get for primary residence versus investment property. Uh, the biggest difference is that down payment is much higher on investment property. They are usually 20 to 25% down payment. On primary residence, we have talked about you can even get a loan for 0% or three or five or 10. Exactly, yeah. uh, but investment, that's the minimum down payment. You're looking at between 20 and 25%, depending on the market and depending on what sales price do you have on that. Um, also, the interest rates are slightly higher. You should budget for about 0.375% higher interest rate than what you pay on primary residence. But in terms of loan process itself, what documentations are required, they all stay the same. So if you bought a home before, or refinanced a home before, all of those requirements will remain the same. Well, viewers, keep watching Mortgage Matters. We'll be back after this short break.
Welcome back, you're watching Mortgage Matters. I'm Krithika Swani in conversation with Shashank Shekhar, the CEO of Orcus Lending. So Shashank, now we're going to take some audience questions. Sure, let's do that. We got the first question by Pranoy. He emailed us saying mm. that he just started with the refinance process. Okay. Anything he should or shouldn't do? Oh, absolutely. There are, there are tons of things that he should not do. Uh, I've seen people making these mistakes. I actually wrote a blog post saying eight blunders you should not do if you don't want to mess up your mortgage. So I'll talk about some of those blunders that I've seen people making. One is that if you're already in the loan process, whether you're refinancing, as in Pranoy is refinancing, but even if someone's buying a home, um, don't change jobs. Don't tell your old employer that you're quitting. Don't change jobs. Don't move to a new employer. Uh, employers do verification of employment all the way at the end of the loan process. Because some people think that, oh, their loan is already approved. They've signed the loan docs. Now what can go wrong? Uh, they do not realize that seconds before they fund the loan, they call your employer to make sure you still work for them. If they say that you have already quit or you plan to quit in a few days, your loan will get stalled, in some cases even declined. And we have had both situations that I've seen personally. Um, don't move too much money around. That's another thing that underwriters look for. Again, whether you're refinancing or buying a home, they want to, any large deposit that comes into the account they want you to paper trail where that money came from. You can't just deposit $10,000 in the bank account and say that, as in we have no source to say where that money came from. Uh, after the 9-11 accident, the incident happened, uh, federal government came up with a rule that in any kind of real estate transaction, we want to source every single penny that goes into the loan process. We don't want any terrorism funding to happen through the real estate transaction. And I know our viewers and clients are not planning to do that, but what I'm saying, that's where the rule comes from. So, so be very careful what large deposits you're putting in. Don't make too many big purchases because we talked about that in the credit score segment, yeah. that it can drop your credit score. And some lenders pull your credit score again. So they pull one at the beginning of the transaction and then they pull one at the end. So if your score has fallen or if you have too many debts that you've acquired, then again, either the loan process can get delayed or can get declined. And most importantly, anything that you do during the process, you consult with your loan officer before you do that. So the next question is by Piyush. He posted on our Facebook page saying that he has heard that making biweekly payment helps you pay off the loan faster. So is that true? Good question, Piyush. Um, it is something that a lot of people try to pursue when they want to pay off mortgage faster. And who does not want to pay off yeah. their mortgage faster, right? Uh, biweekly payment does help. Uh, so what biweekly payment is for, for other viewers who might not understand it is that instead of making a monthly payment of, say, $2,000, if that's what your monthly payment is, you pay $1,000 every two weeks. Okay. But because the year has 52 weeks, you end up making 26 payments of half a payment each, which means you make a total of 13 payments instead of 12 payments over a year. And that extra payment goes towards your principal, so you're able to pay off your mortgage faster, sometimes in 23, 24, 25 years. And while that's great, uh, sometimes setting up biweekly payment could be a little tricky. Uh, sometimes it depends on the lender who, is, who has your loan. Um, sometimes you have a third party who manages your, your biweekly payment. The easier thing sometimes, and I'm not against biweekly payment at all, as in Piyush has a great idea if that's what he wants to do. But sometimes you can just continue the monthly payment, which is what you're supposed to pay anyway, and add extra payment to your principal, as it has practically the same result at the end of the year. Uh, in terms of how much more money you have paid towards your principal and how quickly you can pay off your mortgage. Wow. All right, so we have the last and final question by mm -hmm. Sukhdeep. He emailed us saying that if he already has a very low interest rate on 30 years finance, is there any way he can benefit by refinancing? Sure, and that's a challenge that we see with, with a lot of homeowners right now. Because the interest rates have gone up over the last couple of months, we see that a lot of people have their current interest rates in the threes. 3.5, 3.625, while the current mortgage rates are higher than that. Now, um, one of the biggest things that Sukhdeep can do is shorten the tenor of the loan. And that's something, depending on his loan amount, and he hasn't specified what his loan amount is. But I remember once I wrote a blog post in which I compared a $600,000 mortgage uh, between a 30-year fixed and a 15-year fixed. And by switching from 30 to 15, that guy was saving $180,000 in mortgage payment over the life of the loan. Imagine you can buy two Teslas for that. Yeah. Right? So, so his loan amount may or may not be that high, but even if it's $400,000 or $200,000, you get my drift, right? If you move from a 30-year to 15 years, 
And if 15 years is too high a payment, maybe even 20 years, maybe even 25, by shortening the term of the loan, you're paying much less interest on the loan. And that helps you, of course, save the cost on the interest, pay off your mortgage faster, and the extra saving that you make, you can use that for any other purpose that you want. Well, Shashank, I heard that you're doing a webinar. Can you give our viewers some information about your webinar and where they can sign up for it? Sure. So we were talking about buying investment property in the earlier segment. Of course, trying to teach buying investment property in seven, eight minutes is extremely tricky, yeah. especially for first-time investors, because we talk about cash flow analysis, we talk about appreciation, we talk about markets in the U.S. where it is recommended to buy investment properties in the coming years. Uh, we put all of that together, including the tax implications of buying investment property, which, by the way, is huge, um, in a webinar, uh, because that's almost an hour long. It's much easier to talk about that on that. And uh, we will be doing that for our viewers, uh, teaching them everything that they need to know about buying their first investment property. Um, and all they have to do is really just go to arcuslearning.com slash events, because that's the URL where we save all our future uh, incoming events. And they can look up for the webinar that works for them, uh, including the investment webinar. Uh, they can sign up, and we'll be teaching them all about buying their first uh, real estate investment property. Well, viewers, you can go on AukusLending.com and sign up for the webinar that Shashank Shekhar is going to do on investment property. And you can learn more about investment property in this webinar. So keep watching Mortgage Matters. And thank you so much for watching our tonight's show.